Hello and welcome to Path to Power, episode 11. I'm Matt Cooper. And I'm Ivan Yates. OK, we've lots to talk about today. We will get to the issue of pay later, pay for top bankers and for top civil servants, and how the top and the bottom get paid and the political involvement in that. We're going to spend a bit of time talking about data centres as well as a major issue for the economic development of the country, but a bit like Dublin Airport, very controversial when it comes to the environmental impact as well. But to start, we're going to briefly talk about the potential political fallout from the result of the referendum. As it happens, we're recording this on Friday morning when people are voting, and God knows what number, and this podcast will be available before people finish voting at 10 o'clock. So we're not caught by the same broadcasting restrictions as we're podcasting, uh, but we don't know what the outcome is going to be, so we're a little bit constrained in what we can say. Although, I'm going to suggest to you, Ivan, that... Whatever way this turns out, even if both referendums are carried, and that's not a foregone conclusion, this has been a really bad performance by the government. Even if they win, they were outflanked and outrun and outwitted at times by a very limited no campaign in numbers, but led ably by the likes of Michael McDool, who seemed to be stronger in his performances, I would argue, than nearly any government spokesperson. Well, uh, first of all, that a lot of that is fair comment. Uh, first of all, I, I've never gone with the theory that Ireland has the most sophisticated electorate in the world. I think that people are apathetic. They're not arsed to get briefed on things and they blame everyone else. Uh, whereas in Australia, there's compulsory voting. And, you know, so whatever side of the argument you're on, uh, I, I think... One of the fallouts of this is we're going to see less referendums because simply the political appetite for it. Now, if if it is defeated, and we don't know at the time of speaking, I think there will be very severe ramifications and recriminations against the government, particularly on the carer one. Uh, because, first of all, a leaked document came out in the last few days from the Attorney General. Sorry, it only came out literally as voting started. But what did it say, the leak? It said that the Attorney General's advice was that Strive could actually be quite compelling on the government to actually expend more resources to support carers, uh, particularly outside the family. This so, is using the word Strive instead of Endeavour, yeah, I think, wasn't that, it, that, That's right. But uh, uh, last, last Monday, I, I drove over to Castlebar uh, for a chamber event and I drove back both during daylight hours. I didn't see one poster from every rural road, from Enniscorthy through Carlo, the Midlands, right into, didn't go into Galway City, into Castlebar. Uh, everyone tells me they have not seen anyone on the doorsteps. And, you know, you, you have to ask yourself, not just the government parties, but in fact, the entire body politic is in favour of both. With the exception of, of Ain2. Ain2. Of Ain2. But I mean, like, that, which, which, sorry, that's a bit of a David and Goliath in fairness. Yeah, but does that then mean that for the government that the embarrassment will be limited because instead of the opposition jumping up and down in the doyle last week saying, you made a hames to this, the government will say, well, hang on a second, you were in support of as well. It was up to you to canvas as well as was up to us. Yes, I, I, I do think that the point of it in t across the entire political system because, you know, the they weren't maybe, they were all yes, yes. Uh, and I think I think what's going to be the most stinging thing, if the carers one is rejected, whatever about the uh, dur durable relationships, I can see very clearly and would predict that feminist groups will say, and you all thought it was all right to keep in the constitution a woman's duties in the home. And I think there will be hell to play for that. Well, okay, let me just tease this out a little bit. What I think about this one is that if we'd had referendums to just remove the language in the two articles that was regarded as offensive, that they would have been carried comfortably. The problem has been in the replacement language. That if you said, OK, you no longer say that family is based on marriage, given that so many children are not born by way of marriage, I think everyone would say that's a realisation of the practicality. You don't put anything in its place. Well, you don't put durable relationships. Yeah. You just take out if the word marriage. If you just took that out, I think okay. people would say, yeah, that's fair enough. But then they'd definitely argue one night stand was relationship. Well, anyway, look, the second point is, is that on the other one, that 
I think the duties of a woman in a home is archaic language. And I'd imagine that for most people, absolutely get rid of it. And then suddenly they were confronted with this issue. Well, hold on a second. What's been replaced here with carers? And very much by the arguments of disability lobbyists and Senator Tom Clonan and the rest of it, that this is patronising and it's insulting and it actually is a, a derogation of duty on the part of the state to actually help people who are disabled. And again, it was, I suspect what will have happened is that for a lot of people that who had wanted to delete both of the articles may have gone into the polling booths and if they voted yes, they may have held their nose while doing so, being unhappy with the new mm-hmm. language mm-hmm. been put in, but thinking that even if it was imperfect, it was better than what we had. And then on the other hand, there may have been many people who would have voted no on the basis that they did want to get rid of what was there, but didn't want to put in the replacement language. Now, obviously there will have been no voters who would have wanted to keep the way things mm. are, but I suspect a large part of the no vote, whether it wins or not, will have been on the basis of we don't like what's there, but we certainly don't like what you want to replace it with. On the carer one, I think there is a question to be raised about the wording. What the Citizens' Assembly recommended was to be absolutely gender equality in terms of principle. And instead of the word mother, if they put parent, that it was actually both genders, they could have actually said, look, the modest change we're making is not discriminating between whether it's the mother or father. But there are obligations in the home. There are obligations to rear children. And and I, I, I think when they departed from gender equality, they opened something of a Pandora's box. But let's be clear about this, Matt. I've listened to debates on The Last Word and elsewhere. And the obligation irrespective of who's in favour. I remember with the children's referendum, the obligation to do 50-50 coverage tells me that we ain't going to see many more referendums because actually the modus operandi has made it too difficult to explain it because anyone can get up. It's a bit like Twitter. You know, people are on Twitter and they have no representation. At least the people in Leinster House have been elected and put there. In other words, who and and, and, and some of the spokespersons with the 50-50 coverage, it, it invites misinformation. Yeah, I have to say we had our difficulties in the last word in finding people who would make themselves available to take part in the debates that we did. And that's on both no, sides? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And, well, and that's no insult to anybody who was, who did participate in the debates because we had strong speakers on the debates. But we were very taken, particularly on the yes side, um, by the way, government ministers ducked away mm. from it. Yeah. That really struck me. We were not, if in the political parties, Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, we were not getting heavyweights been offered to uh, us. And they were I all say, running you, from You it. made the point about McDowell. I watched McEntee versus McDowell on the first referendum on The Tonight Show and I saw a few performances from Roderick O'Gorman and there is no doubt that the ministers weren't senior council debaters. You know what I mean? Like, you know. Well, sorry, I mean, Leo Varadkar did a couple of interviews in relation to it which I'm not sure went down particularly well. There was well, there was one on the six o'clock show, yeah, which is my famous Gale Gore uh, uh, venue. <laughs> but the, the point about it is that it, it's it's a lighter show. You know, you're not expected to be cross ackled and I think. The emphasis he put on family care versus state care was definitely open to misrepresentation. That was a gaffe. Yeah. And so, and then me, Hall Martin didn't do particularly well against Maria Steen on primetime, where he accused her incorrectly of being against a previous referendum. And she pointed out she actually hadn't campaigned during the divorce yeah, referendum. Yeah, he, so he got his history wrong. Yeah, he got his yeah. history wrong. And then perhaps wasn't as gracious as he should have been in apologising. Well, he wouldn't apologise for it. Ministers live in a bubble. They're mostly actually what I call plug and play. They're not in a debating set. So we're now we're going to introduce the Minister of Finance, Pascal John, whoever it is, and they make assertions. And it's like it's holy writ. When they're actually put in a one-to-one debating situation, they actually, the bubble they live in d- is a disservice to them because they're used to what they're saying being accepted. We have an email address that I want to tell our listeners about. You've been looking for this, Ivan, and uh, Aidan here has managed to sort it out for us. So it is mail 
at pathtopowerpodcast.com. So if anybody who's listening wants to get in touch with us with ideas for things that they would like us to cover, maybe questions they would like us to answer, mail at pathtopowerpodcast.com is where they can do so. I used to always say to my producers uh, on radio, uh, you know, because, you know, 53106, text in and all that only send me through the bad ones because I, I and, and like they'd be vicious ones and anyone There must say, have been loads no, of those No, 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 no <laughs> but actually but actually all the other it only encouraged more people to text in the other direction and also then it means I can argue with the, the, the texter So don't be afraid to send in abuse of Matt and any criticisms of me <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well let's talk a little bit about the latest in RTE and uh, what do you make you were here very strongly in recent weeks saying that what RT needed in a new chairperson was somebody with financial background. Now, you wanted a liquidator or a receiver, <laughs> which I'm not quite sure is the uh, Terence O'Rourke's credentials. But as a former managing partner of KPMG, as the man who has been chairing the ESB for a number of years and also involved in Enterprise Ireland, is that a fairly good appointment rather than getting an academic or a media lovey. Well, absolutely. Well, well, my, my first requirement is to have someone numerous. You know what I mean? As opposed to some arty farty type, you know what I mean, that is is, is living on some of principles of nonsense. Uh, I saw a figure recently. The total expenditure of RT is about 340 million a year. Right. How much of that goes into independent programming? 40 million. Like, it, like, what are the 1900 people doing? Because they're not making programmes. Uh, so the fact of the matter is, uh, Terence O'Rourke is a busy man. So he was managing partner of KPMG, as you said. He's also the current chairman of the ESB. Also this week, so I think it is a step in the right direction, the Public Accounts Committee, who, as you know, along with the Media Committee, all summer were engaged with the RT issue, issued 21 recommendations. And they can be summed up in one word, which is to have the same level of transparency that applies to every other 100% state body. Because, and, and they're right, because what RTE have done is they've decided who will turn up at committees, what questions they will and won't answer, under the cloak of commerciality. And the, the, the PAC say, you know what, you can rip that cloak well, away. Well, actually, because when it suits them, they put the cloak of commerciality on. You can't ask us this because that's protected confidential information that would damage our place in the marketplace. Then other days when you come back and say, oh, sorry, excuse me, let us put on the public interest cloak. Do not hit us when we have the public interest cloak on because we're doing things that otherwise you would not get in the media. So the PAC have called that out and they've said, you, you, you cannot be facing in two directions at the same time. You cannot be a little bit pregnant. The fact is, if you receive public money, you have to go by the same rules. An accounting officer, the controller, and auditor general. And I think that should be accepted by government. And I didn't hear the minister saying they would accept those recommendations. What about the authority of the minister, Catherine Martin? Has that been undermined in the sort of the flurry of stories about the breakdown of our relationship with Shu and the rally? Uh, the former chair of RT, who on Monday made an intervention the night before the appointment of a successor, basically calling into question the, um, how shall we put it, the sincerity of statements that had been made previously by Councillor Martin and their accuracy. Well, you know, I've called her Catherine Muppet Market Martin since last summer. I thought the moment she couldn't give instinctive, spontaneous clarity on the question of whether people should pay the license or not when it's the law of the land, it was curtains in my mind for her credibility. She didn't even understand her responsibilities as minister. The, the second point, though, that has to be said, the job of civil servants, if you watch Yes Minister, is actually the department's job is to protect their minister. And in all of this, he says, she says, she says, she says, uh, in relation to Shunni Rally, the department stand desperately indicted. They should have had proper memos for all of this, how many meetings took place and all the rest of it. And, and I actually think neither the minister nor the department can reform what RT can't do and fix this. Yeah, but do you think politically is it damaging to her or has it been that as this to and fro has been on the front pages of some newspapers this week, that for the majority of people, they've actually tuned out, that it's too much in the weeds as to how many meetings you had, when the meetings were had. 
does it really matter? Is that actually what matters to people in relation to what they want out of Archie, the service that they're actually getting, the programmes they're getting and what they have to pay for? I think what comes out of all of this is we spoke about Roderick O'Gorman and his, his failure to have proper clarity and impact on the referendum, the migration crisis, uh, you know, a lot of that very poor consultation. We're going to talk about Eamon Ryan and the dysfunction of energy and electricity policy and water and Ireland can't do infrastructure. I think he's at the heart of responsibility for that. Throw in Catherine Martin and our mishandling of this. I actually think the government of Greens, and this comes down to individual Mr. have performed very poorly. Okay, there's something else in relation to when you mentioned the department officials. It also was revealed this week that a new deal has been put in place for the retiring secretary generals of departments. They get a seven year term in a department. It can now run to nine. This is yep. a change that's going to Two be Two year made. extension. And sometimes they can be moved to other departments. Yep. But most of the like time... Like Robert Watt was. Like Robert Watt, exactly, moving into the Department of Public Expenditure and reform to the Department of Health. But in most cases, what actually happens is, is that they retire, maybe go off to the private sector. A deal announced this year that they get one year's full salary upon retirement which is as good a deal as you would get on leaving RT. Now, that's the headline which immediately looks, my God, how could that actually be the case? You retire from your job and you get a full year's salary, and I think in a very tax-beneficial way. Now, there is an explanation behind it. It's to stop them taking up jobs in the private sector or as... Gardening part, leave, as it would be known yeah, in, in the, the private, private sector. Rather than going to, you know, yeah. sort of having a conflict of interest yeah. and yeah. SIP, I want that. So you can sort of understand where it comes from. But at the same time, it does look a bit odd, doesn't it, that when you have government ministers jumping up and down, we want to be informed about payoffs in our companies. And my God, how could you give that much money? And then the insiders in secretary generals and departments get anything between 250,000, 300,000 a year if they leave, or if they don't they get moved on the same salary to a lesser job in another department on a guarantee of five years. Well, this not only applies to secretaries of departments, it applies to CEOs of local authorities in the HSE and so on. And and the fundamental principles behind a seven-year term with a maximum of three-year extension across the public sector, I think is a good idea. PJ Mara, the late, great PJ Mara said, everyone should reinvent themselves every seven years because... You, 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 you can lie on the shovel. This is the way we do things around here. Inertia and malaise can build up. Whereas a, the new kid on the block brings a level of vigour. Secondly, you've got to create a promotional-led opportunity system for assistant secretaries and really bright people. What has happened, though, interestingly, is that the appointment of senior position across the public sector has been given to people in their 40s. These really bright people emerge and actually then they find themselves in their early 50s out of a job. And what do they do? So I, I think there is an issue of mobility uh, and this, this would apply to Paul Reid and, and people like that. You know what I mean? And he was in the frame for RTE. Of course, the other thing in relation to it is, is that part of this new group that's been put together that the government has authorised is that pay for semi-state bosses might be increased as well. Here's the irony. Kevin Backhurst, who's on 250000 plus a 25% allowances and pension top up as well, has said that nobody in RT will earn more than he's earning, that the top dog gets the top pay. But it could be that his own pay is going to go up as a result of this review, which might bring smiles to the faces of lots of people in RT who will now find, well, we're not going to be capped at whatever he's been talking about. We have a new limit to match that Kevin Backhurst will be paid at. Well, this, 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 this goes wider and deeper. As a general rule of thumb, if you go to Bus Aaron, if you go to across the public sector, the CFO rate is 200 grand a year and the CEO rate is 250 grand a year. And that is not, uh, you know, dissimilar. So you know, I know what's interesting about that. And I know an awful lot of people will say, my God, that's an enormous amount of money. And to a lot of people, it is an enormous amount of money. But you've got to benchmark it against what people can earn in the private sector and publicly quoted companies where you see the figures been displayed, but also in a lot of privately owned businesses, finance directors and chief executives are getting paid way, way more than that. Which, when well, we get to the bankers pay in a moment, but it is actually relevant that you can be running a business like ESB, which is making a billion euro in profit, which is another source of controversy. And they have a captive market, yeah. Uh, you have, yes <laughs> we have the no. highest electricity <laughs> prices, well, seven, 700, 700 euros. euro on average per household more than and the, the rest dearest of Europe. in Europe. Yeah. yeah. 
But you have the boss of the year. So you think he should be rewarded for the highest? No, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just I'm raising Give me the issue. a break, man. I didn't say that. Geez, you're a great man for jumping in and making assumptions and taking implications out of the points I'm bringing to you. What I'm saying to you is, isn't it interesting that two hundred and fifty thousand pay for somebody who is in charge of an organisation making a billion euro profit? I, my, my, I put it like this. I'm not going to have crocodile tears over this pay limit at all. You you take, uh, and you know, I know Colin Hunt and I feel his pain stuck on 500 grand a year. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, at 500k, right? Now, the the, the, the CEO of the Bank of Ireland, Mark, whoever he is, no, is on my, nine, my, so my, 950. Miles okay, my, Miles he's, he's on 950 grand he a year. He came back from CRH to take that job. Yeah. Okay. My, sorry, my and he point was probably is been this. Paid more in my, uh, I'll throw two facts at you. The minimum wage is twelve seventy an hour. Yep. Ninety percent of people in this country who are earning money in the public sector, private sector, these are tax returns or self-employed, are under seventy grand. Nine out of ten people. So twelve seventy. I worked it out. Five hundred k, which you're now bleeding about. That's not enough. You know, on a sixty-hour week, you know, you do seven days or whatever you do. Eight, you know, eight hours over seven days a week, or or, or if you do ten hours or twelve hours. It's 166, sorry, 1,666 euro an hour they get. So please, we'll just stop. I'd 500 say, grand is enough for anyone. I'd say Even he, with Nixers. I'd say, I'd say he probably would argue that he works more than a 37 and a half hour No, week. no, I said 60 hours. So oh, if you divide hours, 60 right, okay. hours into 500 okay. grand and say 50 weeks in the year, like it's it's over six, it's nearly 1,700 euros an hour. Give me a break. Okay, can I throw... They're not worth it. I'm sorry, the L'Oreal ad, it doesn't, it doesn't apply here. Can I throw you a few facts without you actually uh, saying that I'm implying support for the facts that I'm bringing you. You love the elements of capitalism that suit you, but carry on. <laughs> okay. The interesting thing about the bankers, uh, the bankers pay is that the 500,000 cap was introduced in 2009 at the height of the crisis. So it's 15 years old at this stage. It is interesting as well to see that AIB has repaid at this stage or is close to having repaid all but one and a half billion of the money that it got to rescue it back in 2009. However, I'm saying that and you're smirking at me. No, I'm ready for you. I right. mean, no, sorry, the point is, sorry, no, no, we have a I duopoly, we have a duopoly oh, in Jesus. banks and they're ripping off every depositor in this country. They're paying less than 2% interest Thanks when for making West my point and every other bank is is, is doing it. Sorry, like, okay, so, no, no, I'm coming back in because you've taken yeah, one of my two okay, points okay, on that okay. because I was going to say that, that in some respects it's very easy for AIB to have made 2.7 billion in operating profits this year because of that point of not paying depositors as much as they should. Also, we have had until recently the most expensive mortgages in Europe. So basically, to actually restore themselves over the last decade and a half, the banks have overcharged on loans and they've undercharged on deposits. And you could argue that no matter who is in charge, be it Colin Hunt or anyone else, and Colin Hunt's in there since 2018, that would have been the case. I also think that Colin Hunt must know. Colin Hunt is possibly, and this is something I'm writing about for the Business Post for Sunday, he must be the most politically attuned chief executive mm -hmm. of any business in the country because he spent a time in the 2000s as special economic advisor, first to Martin Cullen mm -hmm. in the Department of Transport, given that they're both Waterford men. And then he was moved over to Mark Brian Cowan as Minister for Finance. I think, basically, I think he was told to go in and try and actually get Brian Cowan doing his job as Minister for Finance, which a lot of people in retrospect would believe he had his eye off the ball before he became Taoiseach, which was a large part of the problems that we had in the bust. So Colin Hunt knows the way the wind is blowing. He knows, no matter how frustrated he may be that he's getting paid essentially half of what his counterpart in Bank of Ireland is getting, he knows that the government is not going to give him a pay increase this side of a general well, election. And he also knows that if Sinn Féin gets into power, not only will he not be getting a pay increase, but he'd be paying much higher taxes on his income uh, because he'd be regarded as part of the super wealthy. So number one, I think anyone who's belly aching about a salary of 500 euros, weep on your own because I won't be weeping with you. Secondly, 
if you want to incentivize people and give people bonus shares, or if you want to reward, you know, Michael, Michael uh, O'Leary's on this 100 million bonus if he achieves certain things for shareholders. I am not against bonuses, but I think they have to be earned. And anyone with a salary of 500,000 in the public sector is damn well paid. And do you think a bonus of 100 million euro at Ryanair is acceptable? No, no, what I'm saying is that is the market. That is the market. What we're talking about here is the public sector. But then again, Michael O'Leary's campaign in relation to Dublin Airport, wanting the state to do things that effectively would help his personal financial well-being, well, as well as, he says, being better for the state and for tourism well, and all the rest of it. Like but he stands to make a lot of money if he forces Eamon well, Ryan well, to back down. We're going to talk about some of the, the fissures and the fault lines as we face into three elections. But one of them is... Do you support the notion of economic development that Ireland Inc. should actually have an approach to planning, an approach to uh, all these restrictions in terms of 32 million tourists coming into Dublin Airport, that actually we have a choice here. We actually want to raise living standards. We actually want to make this the Singapore of Europe. We actually want to uh, have GDP growth. And we may not always have the tech giants to bring that to us through uh, intellectual well, we property. We won't have the tech giants if we don't have the data centres that actually allow them to do their business. Well, that is that is, that is a real bugbear. I mean, I, I have... Well, let's did, take did, did I ever tell you, Ivan, that I wrote a book called Who Really Owns Ireland? No, you never, <laughs> I never mentioned, mentioned that. that today. Yeah, no, okay. I've never... There's a when was this published? There's a chapter or two about data centres and who owns them in there. <laughs> right. Uh, well, well, first of all, the, the CRU, the, which is the regulator of, of the utilities, right, have issued a consultation paper. And what they've said, and what uh, Minister Ryan has said, is that about... 20% of entire electricity now is consumed by data centres. Now, let's be clear. Uh, Amazon, Google and all the tech firms cannot operate their software, their cloud systems without data centres. The second thing about it is that you cannot have, uh, say you, you have wind power, the wind doesn't always blow. So therefore, they cannot have any discontinuation of electricity supply. So they need, supply. they need backup generators which are usually fuelled by diesel. So, so what Wayman Ryan has, has input into this debate is, I'm sorry, there are 40 data centres that have gone through for approval that haven't been built yet, right? Uh, that basically but, he's saying that no new data centre can be built unless they are carbon neutral. In other words, unless they put their own wind farm in place or solar panel system or and then we drill down into it. We find that Actually, uh, the the 34% of renewable electricity has been stuck at that level since 2020. It now transpires that planning is not going to be given to any more wind for farms onshore because there is no dialogue. Instead of lecturing the world about uh, data centres, he should have a word with the people in the custom house and say, what are you going to do to ensure that offshore and onshore wind is built? And I'll add in one other thing. Biomethane. Biomethane is basically a product of waste. It could be agricultural waste, it could be food waste or whatever. And it generates a gas, which is biomethane, which is the same as the gas that goes through our national natural gas uh, network. And the truth of it is, the government, like in the early days of wind, have to put in place a model for a price of electricity that will be paid for me biomethane for people to invest in the anaerobic digesters. And what's happened? We have no anaerobic digesters. We have all these targets simply because they cannot get planning permission, number two, and the economic model. And, and just to finish this point, KPMG have been hired to put this model, economic model in place. In other words, what price will Airgrid pay or ESB Networks pay for the biomethane? And they have failed to do it. So would you please... Please, Eamon Ryan, stick it where the sun doesn't shine. Because if you want to stop tech development, if you want to stop uh, uh, all the energy requirements and getting to the 80%, would you please be, have joined up thinking in the government? Okay, it's not even more cynical than that in the sense that we don't have an outright ban on data centres. But what we do have is a ban on connecting them to the grid that the grid isn't able to accept them because we haven't invested sufficiently in the grid. Therefore, they can't take the new data centres on board, online. So it's an Irish solution, as usual, to an Irish problem by the back door. But that is going to cause us an enormous amount of grief 
when it comes to new investment. And yes, you can argue that these things consume an enormous amount of energy. I think about one third of all the energy in the country. By 2026. But they yeah. can actually come back and they can actually, if they put in, this, and a lot of them have put in the wind farms and things like that, and a lot of them do have solar panels on, a lot of them can be very easily carbon neutral if they were encouraged and incentivized and given the opportunity to actually and, do and so. Now that you mentioned the grid, let's analyse that. T- 12 years ago, Airgrid came up with a national plan of a north-south connector, an east-west connector, and to actually run the grid into Mayo and Kerry where all this wind is particularly uh, efficient. Let me guess, lots of local objections? Well, would you believe people like Regina Doherty who are now, you know, led the charge in Meath against the pylons going up north. The fact of the matter is... It's the political system has actually put up a sign to the world saying Ireland doesn't do infrastructure. And you know what? Someone has got to take responsibility for this. And I would say the leadership of the government have got to take responsibility. But I do see now there's a couple of statements out from Barry Cowan and Billy Kelleher this week saying that Eamon Ryan is dysfunctional, he has too many portfolios, that there should be a dedicated Minister for Energy to deal with this. I think that applies to all of the Green Ministers, that they all have these multi-portfolios, the three of them, Eamon Ryan, Catherine Martin, Roger Gorman, and surely it's too much that they have to look after, in some cases, five different strands to their actual ministry. But there's a few interesting points as well. Uh, There's been also suggested this week that AI is going to actually suck more data or more power out of the data centres, requiring more data centres to be built. But at the same time, you've got to do a trade-off because an awful lot of benefits environmentally can be brought by the application of AI, not necessarily by using things like chat GBT. But I'll give you an example from aviation. It's reckoned that if you apply AI properly to air traffic control, that you can get flights in to airports much, much more quickly, reduce the amount of time that planes are in the air and therefore reduce emissions. And you'd route them all properly, taking the weather into account. You could take 20% off the emissions. Would you believe it? Because I did a conference recently where they put new technology on milk lorries. And you'd think just bringing the milk from farmer to point B, they can actually save 20% by applying that technology uh, to what is the most efficient route uh, and so on. So, so, But let's let be clear about it. What, what we're throwing out in terms of putting up a sign of no more infrastructure, there's 300,000 jobs depending on, on foreign direct investment, which needs uh, this electricity. We have 24 billion of corporation tax that's paid for everything. And I really, I really cannot get, like, in, you know, and I, I listen to bits of media and we're talking about RT and we're talking about the frippery of life. And right before us, there is, an ex- no, no, there is an existential crisis in terms of electricity. And would you believe believe it, this week, the Housing Commission came out with a report about water. Oh, I know. The water issue is something, again, that we have highlighted here before and elsewhere. So we have this issue that foreign investors are now bringing up belatedly the lack of availability of housing, uh, which we've been speaking about for quite a while. And we have all sorts of infrastructural issues. There's one I didn't give you on our list of topics to discuss, but I briefly mention it. Another really worrying story, which has got no attention here in Ireland so far, but it was in the Financial Times this week. And it is something that I have heard on quite a few occasions, haven't been able to get anyone to go on the record about, because of the fear of the Central Bank of Ireland, the fear of the regulation. And the Financial Times had wrote, wrote a piece about how the IFSC is being affected by those who set up here, we're not talking about AIB, Bank asset of Ireland, management, hedge asset funds, management, yeah, yeah. all the various yeah, other very types global, of things. Yeah. But the, the requirements of the Central Bank of Ireland in relation to fitness for practice, that we know that we had a financial meltdown because of the lack of proper regulation. But we're now very seriously in danger of going too far in the other direction, that the Central Bank of Ireland is making excessive demands to prove about people taking up positions and senior positions, going back into the history of companies they might have worked with 15, 20 years ago as if the people were responsible for that. And this is a threat to future investment in financial services in Ireland. And already the belief is that Barclays has downgraded, having moved a lot of services after Mm -hmm. Brexit to Dublin, has now moved them on to Paris. Mm. 
And you know, when, and it's more red tape, is it? Is that the, the no? It's the uh, Central Bank of Ireland being yes, full of red tape and regulatory authority and regulatory creep and overreach. And yes, you don't want to let have a laissez-faire, let anything go in financial services. And you've got to worry about um, people's money going missing. And we have had many problems and issues in the IFSC going back 15 years ago, 10 years ago. However, you can go too far the other side and that as well, in the absence of attention being paid to it and giving the central bank too much powers could be very damaging to us in the economy. And, and look, since how he established the International Financial Services Centre, it has spawned a whole genre of industries and jobs that Dublin has become a base for that since Brexit. But I just want to go back to this leaked report from the Housing Commission. It has said, and like... I, I just, I, I, like, when apparently people asked Dara O'Brien or his Secretary General, Graham Doyle, uh, what are you doing about all these problems? You know what they said? Oh, we're dealing with the planning bill. We've put every resource into a new legislation. Everyone tells me that won't actually solve any of the problems. And secondly, we're only interested in housing. But Bob Jordan is the head of the Housing Commission. Their job is actually to be the link between Custom House and guys in hard hats, Cairn Homes and Glenvay and Ballymore building houses. And they've come out with this report that has been leaked saying that 85% of Dublin's water and the eastern region is dependent on the Liffey. That with the growth that's planned, right, we're going to have a situation that planning permission will be refused simply because there isn't water. Because there is a major water supply project and it's going to take 300 million litres a day from the River Shannon in the Partine Basin okay. and it is five years behind time. Of course it's five years behind time and it'll be another but five years funny, before. Matt. I know it's not funny. I know it's not funny. But the people of the Midlands and the West of Ireland will say, that's our water. Don't be taking our water. Why does Dublin get everything including but our we're, water? We're a country the size of Manchester. Is anyone going to actually get things done in this country? Yeah. Let's talk about Super Tuesday. I thought you weren't particularly interested in American politics. I, uh, and this was the dullest Super Tuesday of all time. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I mean, interested. it's Trump versus Biden, although <laughs> I still haven't had a chance to listen back to it. Um, I believe Joe Biden State made, of the a, nation. made a very uh, yeah. strong State of the Nation yeah. where he belied the concerns that he was cognitively not up to delivering such an address. Yeah, and 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 I tell you what, they they did a good job on him. He had he was feisty, and I watched some of it, and so on. A couple of big issues. First of all, uh, the whole Gaza situation and the Americans' role in that, and they're now going to have some port development to get the aid in. It, it seems it isn't bombs and bullets. It's starvation, malnutrition. It's, a, and it's it, appalling. It, 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 is, is, so, it is an absolute it, and utter disgrace. So Leo, Leo, as we speak, will be heading to, 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 to Washington. And yeah, the, the, the next that. Friday, and the 15th of March, Leo Varadkar will be in doing the traditional presenting the, sham, the bowl full of shamrock to Joe Biden. Should he give Joe Biden an earful about American support for the outrage of what Israel is doing in Gaza? And... I need to put in the usual caveat in case we have uh, people complaining that to say that what's happening in Gaza is an outrage and is genocide is not to in any way to diminish the appalling nature of the Hamas attack on the 7th of October. That was really bad. But what Israel has done is at least equally bad when you consider the amount of lives lost over 30,000 lives, starvation, appalling. So, sorry, what should Leo Varadkar no, 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 do in the White well, House? Well, first of all, I don't know if you've heard the country expression pissing in the wind. Uh, whatever he says is irrelevant to what yeah, Biden yeah, will do. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I put it like this. Uh, good luck to him. Uh, the, the point I want to make is this. So here we're looking at a geriatric veteran uh, who, who has done some public service on You're one hand. You're talking about yourself again, No, I'm you? talking about Joe Biden, <laughs> right? I'm only 64. Give me a break. This guy is... Is that is, all you are? Jesus, it, you look a bit well, rougher than well, that. I can assure you, I have a lot of miles on the clock. <laughs> against someone who is facing 20 criminal charges. And is that the best uh, a country with 360 yeah. million people can put? And you know what the conclusion I've come to? And this links to the Gaza issue. That actually... American politics has become toxic and it's become toxic because the gateway to power, the gateway to the ballot paper is governed by money. In 2020, and it's going to be more, $14 billion was spent on federal elections alone. So it's now 
not what your policies are, not how articulate are, not what energy you've got or anything to do with your CV. It's actually, can you raise the cash? Well, this is what they call the packs. And so, and I want to talk about one pack. It's the AIPAC, the American Israeli PAC. And this is why I'm saying Leo's pissing in the wind, because the fact of the matter is that both the Republicans and the Democrats are compromised because of the level of fundraising coming from the American-Israeli pact. OK, but a couple of things I'd say to you in that. I mean, what worries me as much about Trump is not Trump himself, although he is, as I've been banging on about for the last decade, an utterly odious individual who is very worrying and dangerous to democracy. But it's the fact that he appeals to so many American people is deeply worrying. And it's also the capitulation of the Republican Party. Even this week, Mitch McConnell, the uh, the Republican leader in the Senate, who has been a highly influential figure in American politics for decades, and who after the insurrection of January 6th finally got a spine and condemned Trump, has now this week endorsed him on the basis, well, that's what the Republican Party wants, so we'll go for it. I mean, talk about spineless. You know, and that's really worrying for democracy that when you have seen somebody involved in a deliberate attempt to subvert the democratic vote of the last presidential election, the correct results, to pander to what is happening uh, when you're in your 80s. I mean, come on, you surely when you get to a situation like McConnell should actually do what's the right thing. No, absolutely, because he he doesn't have skin in the game necessarily anymore. But if 75% of Americans feel they should have a better choice than those two, than than, than Trump and, and, you know, and it really is an appalling choice. It reflects on the systemic failure of the system. And and, and I think it it reflects more on what's going on in American society, which is actually very worrying, which, you know, you can start to argue, have we seen the best of America? The 20th century was the American century. The 21st shows despite the brilliance of or the, the power and wealth of the big companies of the East and West Coast that the rest of America has fallen into a form of decline and will be surpassed by Asia. But you know what? Let's come back to Ireland. Yeah. And as I know you love watching the, the runners and riders emerging from the European elections, what did you make of Cynthia Nimuraku getting a nomination for Fianna Fáil to stand in the European elections? Well, I, I mean, who remembers... The, the the woman who was the host of Eurovision, the year of Riverdance, 29 years well, ago. Well, actually, I used to appear regularly on a late night programme. There was around the same time as The Tonight Show, about 140 years ago, with Claire McKeown and Cynthia. They were on a couch and they'd have, it was kind of a dimly lit thing and it was a bit of crack. I right? don't remember. No, it. no, no. And Cynthia was on it. And I remember, like, Claire was an absolute wild card, but Cynthia was all right. And uh, the truth is, she now lives in, in Carlo. She's a barrister. She's, she's a barrister. Doesn't she's a, a mother. Lot. She's a mother. And 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 I, I would say, because it's interesting, because the first thing I say about these candidates is, oh, it's a dry run for the doll. But actually, Jennifer Murnane O'Connor is a really strong Carlo. She's from Carlo, Carlo TD, and is not going anywhere. So I actually think, well, first of all, you've got to have gender quotas. Uh, you've got to have 40, 30, 40 percent of your candidates female. And, you know, with Barry Cowan, Barry Andrews and Billy Keller, they were offside on that. She no. has she has name recognition. She also has a great love of the Irish language, Ivan, which you yeah. love well, to I denigrate know, so much. Her, no. But you know what it brought to mind for me? And this shows you, Jesus, I'm starting to get old as well, even if I haven't hit my 60s yet. Like you. Uh, You're <laughs> clinging on to that fiction for a long time, but I've been go clinging on, yeah. on for a few more years yet. But anyway, uh, I remember the last time that we had a major Irish language RT figure going for election. Now, there could have been others in the meantime, but given that I was growing up in Cork at the time, remember Trommel Gazadrum, Liam yeah, O'Morrocan? Yeah. And he ran for Fianna Fáil, if I remember correctly, in one of the by-elections for Jack Lynch. He didn't make it though, did he? No, no. and that was one of the things that brought Jack, Jack Lynch down. down. Yeah, and he 79. lost in 79. Yeah. So, Cynthia Nimuraku sort of fell into that thing of the one of the strong Irish language performers in RT. She'll be remembered by many older voters, perhaps, for that, that there's a younger generation to whom she will be unknown. Well, so I, I can add to that. So so now we have the shape of the South constituency coming up. So it's a five-seater, and it has very interestingly this kind of Leinster rump to it, Wexford, Carlo Kilkenny, an area familiar with. And, and therefore that explains her addition, Billy Keller, her Cork this Sunday in the Manella Hotel in Clonmel, Fine Gael are going to select uh, uh, Sean 
uh, Kelly and they're going to select uh, John Mullins. Uh, there's only two going for the convention. I think John's a very interesting candidate. Uh, chairman of Cork Port, uh, President of the Chamber of Commerce. Former boss of Board Gosh. Yes, absolutely. And worked in the ESB. So it's very rare that you have a business executive who's probably on your 500 grand a year being looking to be paid a, an MEP salary and all that goes with it. So I think the way that's shaping up is there, there are three certainties to be elected and they are they are the one Sinn Féin between Senator Paul uh, Galvin and or Kathleen Function who's also from Kilkenny one of those will get elected and possibly two Billy Kelleher will get elected Sean uh, Kelly. Will, Kelly will get elected so now you have a dogfight for the last two seats and the word is that Grace O'Sullivan a la what we talked about earlier, from Waterford, a green candidate could be imperiled. Now you have Mick Wallace there, but it, it, you can actually see it's it's taking shape at the moment and, and, and you know, there'll be lots of wild cards as well. OK, well, that's loads more things for us to talk about in the weeks to come. I'm going to give you that email address again in case you have any complaints to offer about anything that Ivan has said because uh, he loves complaints. He wants to fight <laughs> with you. You heard me you... talking about pissing in the wind. <laughs> Send an email to me. <laughs> <laughs> Mail at path to power podcast. No, there's topics com. they'd like us to cover, like the the you know outer Mongolian elections or whatever. We would be interested. Oh, so you'll probably make bets on that as well, <laughs> would you? Oh, by the way, actually, I think. Cheltenham. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you're, I want to surprise you. Have you any tips for us for Cheltenham? Well, I would. My tip is that Willie Mullins will train ten winners or more. So you have Stateman, you have Bally Byrne, you have uh, El Fabiolo. Uh, you have all these good things, Lossy Mouth uh, and Dino Blue. So I'm I'm a big fan of Willie Mullins. I alluded to his mother's passing recently. Yeah. He is he's he's on ninety four winners. For Cheltenham, which is a record, he will surpass 100 this week. OK. And how reliable are your tips? Well, put it like this, I will lose more than you'll ever lose if they don't come in. <laughs> 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 OK, fair enough. OK, that's it for what, this what week. What continent are you on this weekend? <laughs> Matt's Matt on one of his rare visits to Ireland. <laughs> I might be at a certain rugby international this weekend, but we will be back next week to give you another path to power. Uh, if you want to get in touch, as I said, mail at pathtopowerpodcast.com. Uh, please subscribe to make sure that the next edition drops automatically for you, be it on Apple, Spotify, wherever it is you get your podcasts. And uh, please recommend us to a friend or even if it's somebody who isn't a friend, recommend us anyway, because we do want to get this to as many people as possible, no matter what you might think of it. So from me, Matt Cooper. And from me, Ivan Yates. Thank you for joining us.